The most well-known Prohibition-era rum running ship of them all was a schooner named I'm Alone, which was shot up and sunk by the American Coast Guard in international waters. This incident sparked a diplomatic crisis and triggered a level of outrage rarely seen from Canadians. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard the podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes with your host and author, Andrew McLean. In the 1920s, back when booze was outlawed, Canadians generally followed the news of rum runners' efforts to smuggle illegal liquor into the United States with amusement. Many saw it like a David versus Goliath tale, quietly rooting for the plucky little Canadian smugglers facing down the great American behemoth. Nowhere was this feeling more pronounced than in the Maritimes, where a fleet of ships was built and crewed by Maritimers who were smuggling enormous amounts of liquor into the States. In September of 1928, a massively overweight New Yorker named Jamie Clark arrived in the small shipbuilding town of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. He had come to look at a schooner named I'm Alone. The fine wooden schooner was 125 feet long, 27 feet wide, and powered by twin 200 horsepower diesel engines. She was for sale for the very reasonable price of $18,000, which would be about $300,000 today. Jamie set up a fake Canadian corporation called the Eastern Seaboard Steamship Agencies Limited because, as a nominally Canadian ship, the I'm Alone would not be subject to American liquor laws as long as she stayed one hour sailing distance off of the American coast. Now that Jamie had his fake Canadian corporation all set up and his brand new fast schooner bought, now he just needed a captain to pilot it. He was recommended Thomas Randall. Captain Thomas Randall was a tall, dark, and handsome Newfoundland sea captain, nearing 50 years old, whose famously strong independent streak was only surpassed by his even more famous swaggering sense of style. Even out at sea, Captain Randall would dress exquisitely in silk dress shirts, dinner jackets, tail coats, and top hats. Captain Randall was also a bona fide war hero, accumulating medals from Canada, Britain, and France alike for his swashbuckling naval battles against German U-boats back in the First World War. In his most famous engagement, a German U-boat had a helpless French ship in its sights, and Randall rammed the submarine with his ship. Missing these dangerous adventures, ever since the war ended, he'd actually long been considering rum running already. The only problem was that he found the local bootlanger gangs to be too unprofessional for his tastes. The Maritime's greatest rum running gang was New Brunswick's Madawaska Mob, led by Joe Walnut. But their methods were uh, distinctly less than subtle. Some even had literal actual calling cards saying, tell him Joe sent ya. Jamie and his New York paymasters, on the other hand, were professionals. They offered Randall a percentage of the profits and maximum legal protections for him and his crew, plus $400 a month. That would be nearly seven grand a month in today's money. Randall signed on and sailed the I'm Alone to St. Pierre, the island off the coast of Newfoundland that was part of France, where liquor was definitely legal, unlike anywhere else in North America. And then he had a ship load up on rum. They then sailed to an established meeting place off the coast of Louisiana. On the way, he was met and pursued by an American Coast Guard vessel. During a high-speed chase in which the I'm Alone zigzagged away from the Coast Guard cutter, going slowly as to not reveal to the other ship just how fast she could really go. As night fell, a heavy fog rolled in, 
and the I'm Alone turned off its lights, opened up at full throttle, and escaped. Off of the Louisiana coast, at the appointed hour, the I'm Alone stopped. Out of the inky darkness, a mysterious motorboat approached and cut its engine, waiting. Captain Randall pulled out a stack of 15 half-dollar bills bound by an elastic band, all of which were cut in two. He had been given them by the bootlegger in St. Pierre. He counted the bills until he reached the eighth one. As he'd been instructed, he shouted out the bill's serial number to the waiting motorboat. The motorboat turned its engine back on and pulled up alongside the I'm Alone. A fat man handed Randall the other half of the half dollar bill whose number he had just read off. It was Jamie Clark, who was personally overseeing the first transaction. The belligerent and headstrong Captain Randall was furious at what he considered being supervised, and he nearly quit on the spot. For reasons that only the fat New York gangster knew, Jamie then told Randall to go drive around for two days and then return to offload the 1,200 cases of liquor. Two days later, the I'm Alone returned to meet Jamie once again and offload its wares. After this unloading was completed, the I'm Alone departed for Belize to get more liquor. Meanwhile, Jamie drove the motorboat towards the shore. Suddenly, a Coast Guard cutter appeared out of the darkness. Jamie gunned the engine and raced towards the shore with a Coast Guard vessel in hot pursuit. Jamie didn't slow down as the shore grew closer, and he ran the motorboat right up onto the land. As the Coast Guard ship drew nearer, he cut the fuel line and sprayed gas all over the alcohol. Then he hopped out of the motorboat and lit a match. Jamie never told Randall what happened to that first load of booze. But it was the beginning of a very lucrative partnership, although not a very long-lived one. On March 20th, 1929, the I'm Alone was off the coast of Louisiana with a load of 28,000 bottles of whiskey from Belize. At 5 in the morning, a Coast Guard cutter named Walcott pulled up alongside her and ordered her to heave to. Through a megaphone, Randall called back. You have no jurisdiction over me. I'm on the high seas outside of treaty waters. Can I come aboard, I'm alone, and talk to the captain? Called back the captain of the Walcott. Yeah, if you come over unarmed, replied Captain Randall. The two captains met and got into a several hours long argument over whether or not they were 11 miles offshore, which meant they could get arrested by the Coast Guard, or 15 miles offshore and in international waters, like Captain Randall claimed. Annoyed, and not coming to an agreement, the captain of the Walcott went back to his Coast Guard ship. At 2 that afternoon, he shouted through the megaphone, Heave to or I fire! Captain Randall shouted back, I'll see you in hell first! A machine gun on the Walcott fired. Captain Randall was shot. He looked down, expecting to see blood, but instead he saw a large ball of wax. Rather than firing bullets, the Coast Guard was firing wax rounds, which were used at the time by police during riots. Randall noticed that the machine gun which had shot him had jammed, and promptly ordered the I'm Alone to race at full throttle towards Mexico. The now weaponless Walcott gave pursuit the American Coast Guard cutter was able to match the I'm Alone speed. For the rest of the day, all through the night, and through the next day, the two ships raced hundreds of miles towards Mexico, right alongside one another. During the chase, the two sea captains shouted insults and obscenities at each other through their megaphones. At 7.30 p.m. on the second day of the chase, when the two ships were only 18 miles from Mexico, another Coast Guard cutter called Dexter appeared. Dexter ordered I'm Alone to stop, and Randall, using some particularly colorful Newfoundland vocabulary, indicated that he was unlikely to do so. Dexter opened fire, putting 20 bullets 
real ones this time, into the I'm Alone. Undeterred, Captain Randall's ship kept speeding towards Mexico. Dexter then really unloaded, firing 70 bullets into the I'm Alone. With water streaming in, Randall ordered his crew to abandon ship. After the Coast Guard picked up Randall and the others, except one sailor named Leon Main Guy, who had drowned, they were brought to New Orleans, where they were held without being allowed to see lawyers or informing the Canadian Embassy. From their prison cell, the I'm Alone's crew pooled their money to buy a pine coffin for Leon Main Guy and send his body back home to St. Pierre, where he was from. The Canadian ambassador to the United States, Vincent Massey, caught wind of this and ignited a massive firestorm of outrage across Canada. The Canadian government was furious at the blatant violation of its citizens' rights in international waters, and also the Canadians were being held without legal counsel or informing their embassy. Back in Canada, the Canadian public began to see Captain Randall as something of a folk hero. Meanwhile, in the United States, newspaper outlets wrote some distinctly fact-free stories that entirely fabricated things about Captain Randall. A particularly outrageous and entirely false news story in the venerable New York Times particularly outraged Canadians. That famous newspaper published that as the I'm Alone was sinking, Captain Randall clubbed Leon Main Guy over the head with a bottle so that he drowned in order to hide that the I'm Alone was really carrying a load of illegal immigrants from China? None of this was even remotely true whatsoever. Meanwhile, the lawyers that Jamie provided to defend the I'm Alone's crew further inflamed tensions by publicly calling for the crew of the Coast Guard ships to be tried for murder. The high-profile event escalated further and took on international dimensions. France, who had awarded Captain Randall the Croix de Guerre medal during the war for his heroic rescue of the crew of the sinking French warship while under fire from German U-boats, closely followed the event. French citizens were also furious, with hundreds of people demonstrating outside of the American Embassy in Paris. The British government and its public were also outraged, with the Canadian press reporting, In London streets, restaurants, and clubs, the I'm Alone's adventures form the principal topic of conversation. Meanwhile, newspapers across Canada devoted multiple pages of ongoing daily coverage of the incident. Canadians were so outraged that, much to everyone's collective surprise, certain sections of the Canadian public and media even began clamoring to go to war with the United States over the incident. The violation of Canadians' rights by American government officials has actually just been a really strange mistake. However, when the truth about what had actually happened came out, it only further outraged the Canadian public who are always kind of particularly sensitive to these particular type of indignities. Ah, uh, you see, the Americans had not recognized the Canadian flag flying above the I'm Alone. They thought it was the flag of British Honduras. So while Canadian opinion understood it as a violation of international law that the crew was imprisoned without informing the Canadian embassy, the Americans had actually been communicating as legally required with the very bewildered Honduran Embassy. The revelation that the Americans failed to recognize the flag of the country next door to them only further agitated the already furious Canadian public. In the face of a deteriorating international situation, the Americans released Captain Randall and the crew while the two governments tried to sort out some kind of a compromise. Two judges, one Canadian and one American, were appointed to investigate what happened. For six long years, this high-level inquiry dragged on, dominating newspaper headlines across Canada. In the end, the judges agreed the United States had to formally apologize to Canada, as well as pay a substantial settlement to the captain and crew of the I'm Alone, totaling 
$26,666.50. That's well over half a million dollars in today's money. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.